Well, Yogananda described cosmic consciousness in uh, his book, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, and it's a fantastic chapter. His chapter on samadhi, the experience of oneness with God, I don't think in any mystical literature can you find such a thing. I know that Ramakrishna would describe the stages rising and they would reach a point where he couldn't speak. And St. Teresa of Avila would speak of the, the, the levels of, of a prayer. And she said, after the fourth level, you can't think. And uh, yet Master went all the way to that top and then brought it down to this level. I don't mean to say by saying that, that he was greater than they, because when you achieve oneness with God, you're one with him. There can't be any higher state than that. However, in that state, Master told us he wrote that poem, Samadhi, on the New York subway, of all places. He said that I went from end to end of the line and nobody bothered me for a ticket or anything. In fact, he said, with a small smile, he said, no one even saw me. But uh, the state of oneness with God is when you leave your identity with the little body. You know, science can never know everything about the atom. It can know all the at outward aspects of it, but it can't become the atom. There's only one atom in the universe that you could ever know to its source, and that's your own self, your atom of ego consciousness, which is centered here in the medulla, at the base of the brain, <clears throat> which is why when people are proud or uh, look down their nose at people, it's because of this tension they feel back here. And uh, once you've attained that state of knowing that he became you, the amazing thing is space and time don't exist. They're all illusions. Once you can know the absolute reality of even one little atom, your little atom of ego, you become the universe. You go beyond the universe and you become one with God. Now, <clears throat> an interesting thing is that there are levels of awareness even then. Because after attaining oneness with God, there are two levels of samadhi. Sabhikalpa, you go into that state, but you have to come back to your ego from your meditation. Nirbhikalpa means when you're in that state and your ego is emerged into it also, and so you uh, can go about your daily duties, eating, talking, sleeping, and uh, are never affected. This is the state of a liberated master or, or a jivan mukta, not fully liberated, but liberated from old ego. Now, when you reach liberation on that level of jivan mukta, you still have the memory of you, <clears throat> let's say Joe Smith, as a pirate, as a businessman, as a conqueror, as a soldier, as whoever, whoever, whatever it might be, as a woman, as a man, many people go through both, but I think essentially they're one or the other, either male or female, but they go through many different incarnations. You cannot say that one is more important or more worthwhile than the other, just as you can't say that one side of a coin has more value than the other side. They're the same. However, you must go through all those lives and realize that it was God in your memory who was all those things. And when you reach that point, finally you reach the state of Paramukta, or Siddha, a completely perfected being. Now, once you attain that state, I remember Sister Gyanamata, she attained that state, Yogananda said that she had. He saw her, he said, I saw her sink into that watchful state. Most people are like her. When they've gone through all the suffering and struggles and efforts of so many incarnations, they reach that state of Final freedom, most people say, fine, I don't want anything more. Very few have such compassion for mankind that uh, it's sort of like a story of uh, three men who left a village in India. It's a story Ramakrishna used to tell. And they came to a high wall that they'd never seen before. 
And they thought, well, let's see what's on the other side of that wall. So they decided that if uh, one could step on the other one's shoulders and the other one somehow could get on his shoulders, they might be able to reach the top of the wall. And they said, well, we'll get one of us up there and then he can tell us. Well, once the other one got on top of the wall, he looked down on the other side and he clapped his hands joyfully and jumped down into the garden. And the others waited and waited and they thought, well, what can this be? So they decided that the second one promised faithfully, I will come back. And uh, they managed to find a stump and the first one stood on the stump and the second one got on his shoulders and got to the top and he looked down and he clapped his hands joyfully and jumped down on the other side. And the first one waited and waited and he thought, well, what is this? And finally he went and he found a tree, tree and he leaned the tree, a, a fallen tree, leaned the tree against the wall and climbed up the wall and looked down and he saw on the other side the most beautiful garden he'd ever seen. And his first thought was, I want to enjoy this garden forever. And uh, then he thought, but if I do, all my village comrades and companions and neighbors won't know about this. And so he jumped down and went and told the village. And so it is that very few people who attain that state have such compassion for people that they decide to come back. Yogananda had that compassion in a book of, uh, in a poem of his called uh, God's Boatman. He said that, I will come back if need be a trillion times with head, broken head and broken limbs, if need be, as long as one stray brother is weeping by the wayside. And so Yogananda was not one who attained that state in this life. He attained it many, many lives ago. He was, as his gurus were, what is known as an avatar, one who has come down from that state of complete oneness to help others. Such was the life and the person also of Jesus Christ. And very few people have that.